Hey everyone, let's continue our discussion of normal subgroups. And so our next result, and this is going to be an application of the normal subgroup test, but we'll call this lemma 14.2, and it goes like this. If uh, phi from g to h is a homomorphism, homomorphism, then uh, the kernel of phi is a normal subgroup of h, uh, oh, not h of g. <clears throat> right. So what this tells us that the kernel of a, of a, a homomorphism is always a normal, normal subgroup of its domain. <clears throat> now, so the proof here will be an application of the normal subgroup test. And so let's see what we'll do is, uh, let's call it this. Okay, so let's let, um, let's take little g in capital G. Um, <clears throat> and choose, um, what do I want to call it, uh, little x. Okay, so choose little x in g times kernel of phi times g inverse. And I should point out, we already know that the kernel is a subgroup, right? So we don't need to, to actually verify that. We learned that a while ago. So a kernel is always a subgroup of the domain. And now we're showing that it's actually a normal subgroup. <clears throat> so what I want to do, remember the, the normal subgroup test goes like this. What I need to do is show that g, um, I need to use a different symbol. How about g, k, uh, g inverse is contained in k. That's, that's what I'm doing right here. So I want to cho choose somebody in this side right here, and I need to show then that this chosen little x lives inside the kernel of phi. Okay, so uh, then what does that mean? It means that x is equal to g times y times g inverse for some little y in um, the kernel of phi. All right, so now my goal is to show that x is in the kernel of phi, which means I need to compute phi of x. We can say now, uh, phi of x, well, that's going to equal phi of g, y, g inverse. <clears throat> and then we've got a homomorphism, so I can split this up as phi of g, phi of y, phi of g Oop, phi of g inverse. Ah, but now uh, y lives in the kernel, which means that phi of y is equal to the identity. So this will be phi of g times the identity. Remember, this is the identity in h, so I'll put a little e sub h there. And then phi of g inverse. And then using another property of homomorphisms, right? So this e to the h, that's going to be gone. And then phi of g inverse is the same as phi of g inverse. These cancel out and give us e sub h. Thus, uh, so what did that say? It says... Um, uh, it says that x, right, we computed 5x, we got the identity. That means that x is an element of the kernel of phi. And so we have, so what did I do? I picked somebody in g times kernel of phi times g inverse. I showed that it lives inside kernel of phi. So we've shown containment g kernel of phi g inverse is a subset of the kernel of phi. And then to finish off the proof uh, by uh, the normal subgroup test, kernel of phi is a normal subgroup of g. All right, so that completes the proof. And so this tells us here's one way to always come up with normal subgroups. Every time we have a homomorphism, that kernel is going to be a normal subgroup. <coughs> Okay, so now uh, we, we've defined this thing called normal subgroup, but the question is why, right? I mean, there's this, this strange property that left cosets have to equal right cosets, and, and, and it's, it's a fair question. Why would anybody actually care about such a thing? So I just want to talk about that, why we ever came up with this idea. Um, 
or not we, I shouldn't, I can't really claim, <laughs> I can't claim any uh, um, uh, contribution to this idea. Um, but so let's just, let's just start off. I want to start off with a sub. So let H be a subgroup of G. And I'm not claiming that it's normal at this moment. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do is talk about the left coset. So elements of G mod H are of the form, right? So what do the elements look like? Um, they look like uh, left cosets, right? G H, <clears throat> where um, uh, little g is an element of capital G, right? So what we have then is we have G mod H. That's a set, right? It's a set of left cosets. It has no, uh, it, it has no structure on it in terms of, of, of you know, let's say group theoretic structure at this point. But what if you wanted to turn it into a group? In other words, what if we wanted to multiply uh, left cosets? Well, okay, so if I took a couple, you don't need to write this part down. So, so if I took a couple of cosets and I said, all right, here's one element, right? We're living in, in, in G mod H. Here's one element, A times H, and I want to multiply it times BH. The obvious thing that you might want to try, okay, if we we're going to come up with, if we we're going to cook up a way of multiplying these two elements right here, the obvious thing to do would be to do that, right? If you want it to work out and we want life to work out nicely, this would be the obvious thing that you would hope would happen. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's say it this way, a natural way To multiply cosets, and maybe I should say a natural way to uh, try, so to attempt to uh, multiply uh, elements of G mod H is what I wrote down there, AH <clears throat> times BH equals AB times h. But now here's here's the here's what could go wrong. <clears throat> each coset, each left coset is an equivalence class. And so uh, here's what could go wrong. And once again, you don't need to write this down. We can have a situation, right? I mean, it's 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 possible, very common, right, to have different left coset representatives, two elements of G, so that when we look at a H and a hat H, it gives us the same coset, and also we could have this situation B H equals B hat H. Okay. Now, if this is going to make sense, then when we do this. And we say, okay, that's going to give us A, B, H. And then we do this. That's going to give us A hat, B hat times H. These better be the same, right? Otherwise, what we have is our attempt would fail because it would not be well-defined. Different choices of representatives of our cosets would give us different outputs here. Right, so, <clears throat> so let's say that now. Um, since each cosa, uh, left cosa, is an equivalence class, uh, we need to show, or Really, we need to, not to show, <clears throat> what we need, so we need <clears throat> uh, this to be independent of the choice of coset representative. 
In other words, if we want this to be a binary operation, it's got to be well-defined. Right? So <clears throat> let's just say that, you know, suppose it is. So suppose um, that, right, when we, uh, that we do g mod h cross g mod h to g mod h defined by um, a h times b h <clears throat> equal to a b h. Right? Let's just let's suppose that it is well defined. Suppose this is well defined. Okay, um, <clears throat> now what I'd like to do, <coughs> so let's take an element, so um, let's let little g uh, be in capital G, and uh, let's let, um, we'll call, it, uh, call it little x. <coughs> so let's let little x be in um, g h g inverse. Notice what I might be doing here, hopefully you can see what I'm doing here. I'm taking a look at normal subgroup test. So what does that mean? Or I'm about, I guess I should say, I'm about to apply the normal subgroup test. Um, so then um, x <clears throat> is equal to g uh, times little h times g inverse for some uh, little h in capital H. <clears throat> now, okay, so what does that tell us? So then, so since xg is equal to gh, we have <clears throat> um, so let's see, I want to look at xg times h, well, is that how I want to write it? Yeah, xg times h, and we know that this is equal to um, gh times h. And now, <clears throat> this is equal to g capital H times h times capital H. And of course, since little h is inside capital H, this is the identity coset right here. So this is GH times EH, <clears throat> which is equal to GE times H. We've assumed that this is a well-defined operation, so I can combine these back together. GH times EH equals GEH, which is equal to <clears throat> G times h. Now, what does that tell us? Well, okay, so we have this coset is equal to this coset. Um, <clears throat> um, yep, so we can say so. Um, h which we know is equal to g, g and or write that way. Yeah, ah, let's write it. We know it's well defined. So this is g h times g inverse h. Which is equal to, so let's see, g h we know is x xg times h, right? So these two are equal. So this is equal to, um, uh, is that what I want? Yeah, xg times h times g inverse h, which is equal to xg g inverse h, which is equal to xh. Therefore, so what do I have? I have xh is equal to h, which means that little h has to live in, uh, sorry, little x has to live in h. So therefore, x is an element of h. 
So now look at what we did. We started off in G, H, G inverse. We ended up in H. Um, we can say, let me finish the sentence. And so <clears throat> G, H, G inverse is contained in capital H. So there took, you know, it took a bit of computation to show this. But now by the normal subgroup test, um, uh, 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 H is a normal subgroup of G. So what just happened there? We said, let's start off, we start off with just a subgroup H. And we said, suppose that this idea of multiplying cosets, right? AH times BH equals ABH. Suppose that that actually is well defined. Then by doing some computations using the fact that this is a legal way to, to, to multiply, uh, forced us to conclude that the H was actually a normal subgroup. So if it's well defined, if that operation of multiplication is well defined, then we would have to have a normal subgroup. And so at the beginning, a few minutes ago, I said, why would we ever care about this idea of normal subgroup? Who cooked it up? Why would, you know, it's kind of a weird thing. Why do we care whether left cosets are equal to right cosets? Well, it turns out that if you were wanting to define <clears throat> a multiplicative structure on the set of left cosets, then you absolutely would have to have this property that left cosets are equal to right cosets. So that's where it comes from. In an attempt to create a way to multiply cosets, it forces you to impose this condition of normality on capital H. Right? So that's where it comes from. <clears throat> Um, and, and, okay, fine. So what we showed was if, um, if coset multiplication is well-defined, then we have a normal subgroup. Let's consider it from the other direction also. So what if we have a normal, normal subgroup? So conversely, uh, suppose uh, that we started off with a normal subgroup of G. Um, now what I'd like to do, so, so let's say now, let's just define this. So for uh, A and B in capital G, let's define um, <clears throat> A H times B H equal to A B times H. And now what I'd like to do is show that with the assumption that we have a normal subgroup, right, then this is actually a well-defined operation. Right? So we showed well-defined implies normal. Now we're going to show that normal implies well-defined. Um, <clears throat> so to show, or to see, to see that this actually gives us a binary operation. So to see that this is well defined, uh, suppose a h is equal to a hat h and b h is equal to b hat times h, right? So we want to show that if we chose different coset representatives and did this operation, we get the same thing. Um, <clears throat> so let me see. Um, right, so okay, so what does this mean? So then, uh, and let me, I want to multiply correctly here, so, um, so, uh, right. <clears throat> so then, what does it mean for, for cosets to be equal? So then we have A inverse times A hat is an element of H, and B inverse times B hat is an element of H. And so, what does that mean? It means that A inverse times A hat is equal to somebody in H, which means that A hat is equal to A times little h, and uh, right, let's call it... Um, h1, and b hat is equal to b times h2, 
for some, uh, H1 and H2 in capital H. <clears throat> okay, so now if uh, X is in A hat, B hat times H, uh, then uh, X is equal to A hat, B hat times, uh, let's call it H sub 3 for some uh, uh, some H3 in capital H. So now, uh, so uh, let's say then, um, let's see, what is X equal to? X is equal to A hat, which we know is A H1 times b hat, which we know is um, b h2, times h3, which is equal to, so let's write it like this, a, I want to move my parentheses around, so this is a h1b times h2 h3. <clears throat> now, Let's focus on the parentheses right there, H1 times B. Since uh, H is a normal subgroup of G, and H1 times B, that's an element of the, uh, uh, the right coset H B, which we know is B times H, um, we see that, all right, so if this element lives in this group right here, or this, sorry, this left coset right here, then H1B can be expressed as B times somebody else in H. So we see that H1B is equal to uh, B times, now I cannot say that it's H1. This is the essence of being normal, right? When left cosets are equal to right cosets, it does not mean that I can interchange the H1 and the B. What it means, though, is that H1B is equal to B times, let's say, H4 for some <clears throat> H4 in capital H. This is key. That is what it means for the left coset and the right coset to be equal. You cannot interchange directly, right? They don't commute necessarily, right? But you can interchange the order as long as you replace the H here with some other H element. That, and that's what I was, I was saying last time. When that finally clicked, then I, I understood normal subgroups, right? That was the thing that had to kind of process in my brain. And once it happened, then, then I don't know, it all came together. Um, okay, so, um, so now we have x equal to, um, let's see, so it's going to be a times, okay, so what can I do with this h1b? I can replace that with um, uh, 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 bh4. So A, B, and then I have an H4, H2, H3, which is an element of A, B times H. Therefore, um, uh, A hat, B hat, H is contained in uh, A, B, H. So I've shown that the uh, the this coset is contained in this coset and a similar proof so similarly um, a b 
H is equal to A, uh, A hat, B hat, oh, contained in A hat, B hat, H. <laughs> Um, and so, we conclude that, um, let's see, what can I conclude here? That A, B, H is equal to A hat, B hat, H. The left coset is equal to the right coset. Um, uh, a few weeks ago when I first defined or first talked about left cosets and right cosets, I said, there's this process. You absolutely have to use this process when you're showing left cosets are equal to right cosets. Use the group theory and so on. Don't show containment of, of cosets to show they're equal. Show that the inverse of one side... Uh, remember, I was this, this thing right here. A, A, uh, let's use different symbols. Um, XH equals YH if and only if... Uh, uh, y inverse x is an element of h. <laughs> now, I could have done that, but I didn't really want to deal with inverses in this case. And so uh, this is one situation where, yeah, in the end I chose to show that these, these cosets are equal. What I did is I actually did, contain, I did a containment argument. It's because I really I didn't want to deal with inverses. I wanted to just get to that point right there. <clears throat> Anyways, what did we just show? We showed that, that operation is well defined. Um, so conclusion. Oh, I just said conclude. Um, so as a consequence, we have um, the operation a h b h equal to a b h is well defined. So what do we show now? And I haven't—I never wrote theorem or anything like that. We're really just having a discussion. But this discussion gave us the the complete characterization, the complete connection between being normal and being able to multiply left cosets. What we have now proved is that H is a normal subgroup of G if and only if the operation of coset multiplication that we define is actually well defined. So let's kind of um, let's pair or uh, uh, let's summarize. <clears throat> so summarizing, uh, G, uh, no, 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 sorry, H is a normal subgroup of G if and only if. A H B H equals A B H is a well defined, or in fact, we could say this even better, is a binary operation. On G mod H. And guess what? That's where we're headed. We want to multiply cosets, left cosets, because we want to choose, we want to turn G mod H into a group. And what we just showed is if you want to turn G mod H into a group, you need a binary operation, and so you absolutely have to have a normal subgroup. And now, <clears throat> let's just come out and say it. So I, mean, I, don't, I was maybe being a little bit, not secretive, but you know, I didn't want to spill the beans too soon. I kind of wanted to let this story unfold, but now the, the, the story has unfolded. Um, so it goes like this. So if um, uh, uh, H is a normal subgroup of G, then G mod H is a group under the operation. I know I've written it a bunch of times, but I'm going to write it again. So operation of coset multiplication that goes AH times BH equals AB times H. Now, <clears throat> well, uh, we've shown that we've got a binary, binary, ugh, binary operation, but there's more to, more to it. 
So there's some there's something to prove still. So proof. Uh, we showed that um, the operation is a binary operation. So we showed that um, a coset multiplication is a binary operation on g mod h, right? That's what we just finished. <clears throat> So now we need to show that the axioms hold. We need associativity and we need an identity. We need inverses. So let's look at associativity. So first, if um, A, B, and C are in capital G, then <clears throat> let's look at A, H, B, H times C, H. Right? This is how we would check associativity. Um, this is going to be ABH times CH, which will equal um, uh, uh, AB parentheses C times H. Now, we know that we have associativity within G, so I can slide these parentheses. All right, so this step right here is associativity in G capital G, and then we just unravel things. So this is equal to um, AH times a, a, a BCH, which is equal to AH times parentheses BH uh, CH. So that takes care of associativity. Now we need an identity. Um, so, uh, H, or I'll say it like this, um, given, um, uh, G, or, or let's use A, little a in capital G, note that, <clears throat> uh, G H times E H is equal to G, uh, oh, G E H, which equals G H. So this, and, and, and you know, I, and, okay, I got to do it both directions, um, which is equal to um, uh, E G H, which equals uh, E H G H. So this coset behaves like the identity. Thus, the coset, which we just write it as H rather than EH, so H, which is EH, is the identity, identity in G mod H. Uh, now we need an inverse also. And here's the thing. I mean, this just works out the way it's supposed to be. So um, given A in capital G, note that A, H times, I mean, if, if, if life is going to be nice, this should be the inverse of this coset. And guess what? It works out. This is equal to A, A inverse H which is equal to the identity times H, which is H, and same thing in the opposite direction, A inverse H times AH equals A inverse A times H, which equals H. Therefore, the inverse of the coset AH is equal to A inverse times H, exactly as you would hope things would work out. So that completes the proof. And so what do we have now? <clears throat> we have, starting with a group and a normal subgroup, we have learned that we can create a new group 
Who is that new group? It's the set of left cosets. And this has a special name, so we'll end here with a little bit of, or a piece of terminology. Um, G mod H is the quotient group of, uh, how do I say, G modulo H, I think it is. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, just G, G by H. All right, so quotient group, or in other, uh, I think in your book, they might call them factor group, so or factor. Uh, they can be used interchangeably. I just, my, the, my, my choice, my preference is to use the word um, quotient group rather than factor group. Okay, so that's a good place to stop, I think. Yeah, that's a good amount of time. And so what we'll do is we'll pick up with examples of this stuff in the, in the next lecture. Okay, so see you later.